This is the Sitecast by MD Edge, special best of edition. And welcome to this best of edition of the Sitecast by MD Edge. We will be back with brand new content in 2021. There's going to be a hiatus. No new show in the week between the Christmas holiday and the New Year holiday here. And the next episode of the Sitecast, uh, regularly scheduled weekly episode, will be the first Wednesday of the new year. In this best of edition, we're going to do best of master classes. We had quite a few master classes. They were spaced out at the beginning of the year and then... We got them ramped up again uh, toward the end of the year. So we're just going to get right into it. This is a longer episode to give you some time to kind of catch up and maybe revisit some things you didn't get around to earlier in 2020. Uh, If you like timestamps of which lecture is going to be in which location, you can find that in our show notes. You can also find links to the original episodes themselves on our homepage and from our the Sitecast homepage from the episode pages you can find subscription links to things like Apple Podcasts, Pocket Cast, Spotify, Pandora, Google, etc. All that's available via the show notes. In order, we're going to start with a lecture on bulimia nervosa and complications. And then we're going to move to a lecture on telepsychiatry as uh, that was a big topic this year with the pandemic. And then we're going to finish up with our most recent masterclass lecture, which was all about recent literature in cannabis and marijuana. We hope you and yours have a happy and safe holiday from all of us at MD Edge. We'll see you again in 2021. I'm Patricia Westmoreland, a forensic psychiatrist and attending psychiatrist at Eating Recovery Center in Denver. And I'm also an adjunct assistant professor at the University of Colorado Department of Psychiatry. Today I'm going to talk about the medical complications of eating disorders, specifically bulimia nervosa. It's been said that nearly all the medical complications of anorexia and bulimia can resolve with consistent nutrition and full weight restoration regardless of how extensive they are. This is particularly true for individuals with bulimia who are generally close to normal weight and in terms of their behaviors, if they're able to stop their behaviors before too much damage has been done, they can typically return to normal health. The way we think about eating disorders and medical complications. Individuals who have anorexia nervosa, their medical complications are usually due to weight loss and malnutrition. What we're gonna talk about today is individuals with bulimia nervosa whose medical complications are typically due to the mode and the frequency of their purging. Two types of purging in individuals with bulimia nervosa um, are noted. Firstly, self-induced vomiting, and secondly, laxative abuse. We're not going to talk today about excessive exercise, which some also consider a form of purging. So let's begin by talking a little bit about mortality in bulimia nervosa before we talk about morbidity. There's a lower mortality rate in individuals with bulimia nervosa as opposed to those with anorexia nervosa. However, people with bulimia nervosa have a mortality rate that's twice that of age-matched individuals because they can have severe electrolyte and acid-based disturbances that result from their purging behaviors. As I often tell individuals with bulimia nervosa, it doesn't matter necessarily what your weight is. You can be normal weight, you can be underweight, you can be overweight, but acid-based disturbances and severe electrolyte abnormalities can kill you at any time without warning and at any weight. 90% of those who engage in purging purge via self-induced vomiting or laxative use. In terms of self-induced vomiting, I'm going to begin by discussing a short little clinical vignette and I will give you the answer to the vignette at the end of the section. 
This is a 42-year-old female with a 10-year history of bulimia nervosa. She was admitted to a residential treatment unit to interrupt her daily binge purge behaviors. Her current body mass index is 22, so she's approximately 100% of normal body weight. She stopped purging three days ago, but then her face became swollen and painful. Which statement do you think is true? A, she has edema. B, the diagnosis is sialadenosis. C, she should not be given anything sour tasting. D, you should give her diuretics. Or E, none of the above. So in discussing self-inducing vo induced vomiting, there are local complications and, as I said previously, electrolyte and acid-base abnormalities. Local complications are those such as gastric reflux, which leads to dysphagia and dyspepsia, hematemesis, which is due to tears called Mallory Weiss tears in the esophagus. There's epistaxis, which is nose bleeding, and subconjunctival hemorrhage oral mucositis, chelitis, and perimolysis can also occur, as can parotid gland enlargement and sialadenosis. In terms of electrolyte and acid-base abnormalities, an individual with bulimia can develop metabolic alkalosis, hy hypokalemia, or volume depletion leading to aldosterone secretion to maintain blood pressure, which is then called pseudobardus syndrome. I'll discuss that in a little more detail in a few more slides. In terms of treating local complications, acid reflux can be treated with proton pump inhibitors, and these individuals should probably also be screened for Barrett's esophagus, so that would involve uh, gastroscopy or esophagoscopy. In terms of dental and oral issues, they should take fluoride mouthwashes, they should brush their teeth gently because their enamel may have been eroded, and they should practice good oral hygiene. In terms of parotid gland enlargement or sialadenosis, this should be treated with silagogues, for example, sour candies, and anti-inflammatory medications and hot packs. What about the treatment of electrolyte and acid-base abnormalities? Potassium should be replaced as needed, and if it's severely low, these individuals may need cardiac monitoring or a short stay in the intensive care unit. I have in my career seen individuals with potassium as low as two, and it's very important to get them ICU treatment or at least cardiac monitoring and intravenous replacement of potassium pretty quickly. In terms of pseudobarter syndrome, with the cessation of purging, aldosterone doesn't normalize for a few weeks, and this is why these individuals develop edema. So as you'll remember, um, in terms of aldosterone secretion, when people are, are dehydrated, the body secretes aldosterone so that one can maintain one's blood pressure. But this does not just switch off right away when the purging stops, and that's why it doesn't normalize for a few weeks, and that's why these individuals develop edema, because remember, aldosterone makes you retain water. How do we treat these individuals? We give them spironolactone at doses between 25 and 200 milligrams per day. Let's get back to our clinical vignette. Well, remember, we have this individual who stopped purging three days ago. Her face became swollen and painful. And yes, while she may have edema at some level, the diagnosis of the swollen and painful face is parotid gland enlargement, and she therefore has sialadenosis. And we should actually give her things that are, are sour tasting. These are called silagogues, and these actually help reduce the inflammation. Let's talk about our second mode of purging in individuals with bulimia, which is laxative abuse. I'm going to start with another clinical vignette. This is a 50-year-old female with a 20-year history of bulimia seen in your outpatient psychiatric clinic or your outpatient office. She confesses to purging through the use of laxatives, taking 100 stimulant laxatives a day. What should you tell her to do? Gradually taper the laxatives, that would be A. B, stop them immediately. C, 
Tell her she can't damage her colon with laxatives, so it's okay to keep using them. D, give her diuretics, or E, none of the above. So there's something called cathartic uh, colon syndrome that occurs in individuals with bulimia. And what happens is that stimulant laxatives stimulate peristalsis by direct effect on Auerbach's nerve plexus. Continued use of the stimulant laxatives leads to nerve damage. These nerves are basically being overstimulated and overused. So the colon is then converted into basically an inert tube that it's incapable of propagating fecal material. And this leads to severe constipation. And in very, very extreme cases, individuals who have bulimia may have to have a total colectomy. We don't know how much time or how many laxatives it takes to cause cathartic colon syndrome, but once it's been caused, it is irreversible. And as I said, these individuals may have to have a, co a colectomy. So the treatment is that the patients must cease laxatives immediately. And those are laxatives containing Senna, Cascara, phenothiolene, or Bisacodyl. So getting back to our clinical vignette, we really can't tell this person to gradually taper the laxatives because by that point she might actually be causing further damage and we don't know where along the trajectory the damage will happen. We certainly shouldn't tell her that she can't damage her colon because as I've said, she absolutely can. Giving her diuretics is not going to do anything. So we should tell her to stop laxatives immediately. And by the way, individuals who have been using laxatives for a long period of time can be treated with osmotic laxatives like Miralax without causing any further damage, but given their propensity to abuse laxatives, these laxatives should be given to them by a physician who should be monitoring or asking how much they're using. Typically on a residential unit, we will give these laxatives twice a day. And as I've said, osmotic laxatives, not a problem. Stimulant laxatives, big problem. So in summary, we discussed with individuals with bulimia, their medical complications are due to the mode and the frequency of their purging. And most complications are reversible for individuals with all sorts of eating disorders with effective treatment and nutrition. And I'd like to point out specifically with bulimia, this means stopping the purging, whether it be laxative use or whether it be vomiting. Thank you. Hello, my name is Jay Shore. I am a psychiatrist and I am director of telemedicine for the Arthur and Helen E. Johnson Depression Center, as well as director of telemedicine programming at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Campus Department of Psychiatry. I'm recording this SciCast masterclass on direct to patient in home video conferencing. I um, before uh, before we get started with the content, I have a, a few disclosures. Um, one, uh, I, I do do some work for multiple organizations in the realm of telepsychiatry and telemental health, but I'm solely responsible for the content of this presentation, and it doesn't represent any official policy or endorsement or opinion of any of the organizations which I'm involved. I'll be presenting some legal and regulatory material, and that's presented as information only and not intended to represent legal or regulatory advice. Individuals should seek consultation through their specific organizations. In terms of disclosure, I also work as Chief Medical Officer for Access Care Services, which provides telehealth and technology services uh, in, in Colorado, as well as Alaska and I've uh, received royalties from the American Psychiatric Press and uh, Springer Press. Uh, in addition, before I get, uh, begin my discussion, this, this tutorial is really to help people rapidly get familiar with some of the highlights of uh, video conferencing and mental health, or what's often referred to as telepsychiatry. 
Um, and it's really in response to the COVID pandemic and uh, the need that many people are having to uh, socially or at least physically distance themselves. Uh, it's not intended to override other guidance or policies and in, in, in organizations and that um, uh, people should be aware we're in a very rapidly evolving a regulatory environment. I'll talk about some of the changes uh, that, uh, that are being impacted in terms of telepsychiatry in COVID, um, but uh, people should be aware that uh, and stay up to date on how uh, regulatory uh, uh, barriers are, are decreasing but may increase again de depending on emergency uh, declarations and status. So uh, with the remaining time, I, I tend to break up in my mind doing te telepsychiatry into three major areas, administrative considerations, technological considerations, and clinical considerations. So I'll review each of those areas, and I'll conclude with uh, the discussion of further resources uh, that are available that could be helpful to people. So we'll start with administrative considerations when, when uh, conducting uh, telepsychiatry and, and beginning to use video conferencing to see uh, patients. Uh, one, of, uh, one of the important and key administrative considerations is licensure that, uh, that uh, often comes up. And generally, psychiatrists, uh, medical doctors, need to be licensed in the state where a patient is physically located at the time of a video conference. Although there are uh, exemptions uh, for uh, uh, providers working in federal systems, uh, which, which uh, if you're working in the VA or the Department of Defense or Indian Health Service or other federal uh, system, there may be some state licensure exemptions uh, that you can look into. Uh, notably, during COVID, some states are uh, modifying the restriction of needing to be licensed in their state when, when seeing a patient located there. So providers uh, should uh, specifically look, if they do not hold a license in a state where a patient is, they should default to needing to hold a license there, but they can look either at the licensing uh, website of the, the, that particular state and also the Federation of State Board of Medical Examiners has updates and information about COVID specific exemptions. In addition to licensure, your uh, malpractice uh, company should be aware that you're doing telemedicine uh, and telepsychiatry. Many, um, Many don't require uh, any additions or many policies may already cover that. Some policies may cover, uh, may require an additional rider. Uh, and and, and some, uh, some insurances may not cover it and you may need to get a specific uh, 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 telepsychiatry policy. Um, I know that uh, uh, the APA, uh, as an example, uh, I believe their insurance offers a specific telepsychiatry policy, but there are others out there in the market as well. Um, and then uh, uh, the other big, uh, one of the other big regulations is understanding the prescription of controlled substances over telemedicine. Um, there is an act called the Ryan Hate Act that uh, was, um, that basically is a complicated act, but uh, to, to simplify it, it requires that if you're gonna prescribe a controlled substance uh, to a patient, uh, you need to see them in per a person first, and then as good practice at least once every 24 months to be uh, fully compliant. There's, another, uh, there's a number of details and exemptions within that act, Notably, during the COVID-19 crisis, um, the uh, federal government as of March 17th waived the Ryan Hate Act, meaning you can prescribe controlled uh, substances uh, during the 
COVID emergency without an in-person exam. Uh, the presumption is that that requirement will come back when the emergency declaration has ended. Uh, and also this uh, does not uh, address the, needing, the need to comply with uh, individual state rules and regulations around telemedicine and the uh, prescription of controlled substances. Some states don't have any additional regulations, some states do. So um, both before and after COVID being familiar with both the current federal guidance as well as the state gui guidance um, is important. Administratively, uh, telepsychiatry services should have a procedures and uh, protocol, and, and this is really a standard when doing telepsychiatry. Uh, there are examples out there uh, uh, and, and discussions of this on various websites. Again, I'll refer people back to the American Psychiatric Association. They have a telepsychiatry toolkit a uh, web, web page which uh, can help provide guidance there. The American Telemedicine Association also has some good guidance documents about what needs to go into uh, a protocol. Um, generally, uh, protocols spell out uh, things like uh, workflow for the clinic, how patients are scheduled, billing, documentation, uh, as well as uh, addressing um, uh, psychiatric emergencies that may occur. Uh, this is uh, probably one of the most uh, common questions that, that comes up with people new to telepsychiatry, how to uh, manage and handle psychiatric emergencies if a patient uh, becomes suicidal or uh, maybe have thoughts or threats to harm others or gravely uh, disabled. How do you deal with it? And so one of the first things is, again, within a, a, a clinic protocol or procedures or an individual practitioner's protocol for telepsychiatry, they should define first what would be would constitute an emergency and, uh, and, and delineate procedures for that up front. Um, and then they should uh, make sure to educate the staff they work with and their patients about these, uh, and particularly the patients uh, when they're registering in the clinic or the initial telepsychiatry uh, session. And um, some of the basics, of course, include uh, when you're starting a session, particularly directly into a patient's home, knowing their uh, location at the time of the session. Um, sometimes patients will change locations of homes and um, not uncommon for patients to travel on vacation and wanting to do a telepsychiatry session with you. And that's also where state licensure can come into play, knowing where they're located at the beginning of a session, documenting how to get a hold of them in case you lo uh, lose the connection is, uh, is very important. In your uh, emergency uh, protocol, knowing how and when to contact local emergency services and, uh, and how to access and work with those. Um, 911 is often a local call that's keyed into uh, someone's cell phone. So if you're a provider and you're calling 911 to get support for a patient, um, you uh, need to identify the location. Uh, many states have websites which list the number, the local county numbers of the emergency response. So you can, uh, instead of calling 911, you can call directly into the county where the patient's located to speak with emergency responders. Another uh, tip for dealing with emergency procedures, if you have a patient that you're working with that you believe is at higher risk uh, for um, needing to be managed in terms of an emergency, um, then uh, the American Telemedicine Association and the APA guidelines um, suggest that you consider using a patient support person. A patient support person, or what is termed a PSP, is uh, someone who is there and present in, in the location with the patient, most often a family member or a, a close friend, that you get a release of information from the patient and pre-consent to be able to contact them in the event of an emergency. Then if an emergency situation arises, you can work with the, the person who is um, on site with the patient to arrange 
uh, further disposition, contact with emergency services, or take care of uh, other needs that may be warranted on site. So that was a brief review of some key administrative issues to consider. Let's move on to uh, technical uh, uh, considerations. So uh, what obviously um, some of the basic technical considerations is both the provider and the patient need a video conferencing system that renders adequate um, audio and visual signal, which requires adequate bandwidth to do so. There's a number, a uh, huge number of video conferencing platforms that are available on the, uh, uh, b both, uh, there's both freeware and commercially available uh, video conferencing software that uh, providers can explore. Um, the, uh, the obviously having a software that is HIPAA compliant is important, as well as that uh, does and uh, has the appropriate level of uh, security and encryption for the transmi uh, transmission of video conferencing. Providers should recognize that HIPAA is really a process. It's not just that you have HIPAA secure encrypted uh, software or equipment, but that you, you use that equipment in a manner that is compliant with HIPAA policies, either of your individual practice of your uh, or of your organization. Um, providers may be aware that during the COVID emergency declaration, the uh, Human Health and Services Office for Civil Rights has uh, come out with a statement that says they will exercise enforcement discretion and waive penalties for HIPAA violation against healthcare providers that serve patients in good faith through everyday communication technologies, such as fa FaceTime or Skype during the COVID-19 national public health emergency. I think the key wording here around the, this, the, this HIPAA is not that HIPAA is being waived, it's that they uh, that the federal government will exercise enforcement discretion. So my recommendation is to providers if they have HIPAA compliant software to use that as a first line and only go to uh, technologies, uh, everyday type technologies like FaceTime or Skype if they're unable to make an adequate connection to do video conferencing with the patient with, with the first option or selection. Uh, the other thing uh, worth mentioning technically during the COVID emergency is that uh, many providers and uh, uh, clinics and psychiatric organizations are not only having to turn to video conferencing for their patients, but they're having to do remote teleworking and virtualize their entire operations. And that is different than just doing telehealth. Doing telehealth is using this technology to render clinical care. Virtualizing your operations means adapting your complete operational clinical workflow to a home and virtual environment. It requires uh, additional technologies and platforms, shared EHR, scheduling, um, operations, uh, and the important, uh, some of the important principles in doing that is trying to, the, the, uh, the KISS principle, uh, keep, it, uh, keep it simple, stupid, um, is to not, is to take your um, in-person operational workflow and, and to try and replicate it virtually uh, and making sure that there are clear, uh, clear uh, delineation of people's roles and responsibilities and how the workflow will work in a virtual environment. And it's been amazing to see during the first couple weeks of the COVID emergency, uh, how many how rapidly and how many organizations have been able to completely virtualize their services so people are no longer meeting in person. Moving on to the final area of uh, clinical uh, considerations is, um, is a, a couple really important concepts, uh, particularly for 
providers not used to working under video conferencing. All of us uh, in the way uh, our society is being virtualized and the changes in society in the last decades with technology, I think we're all moving to what is termed hybrid relations. And this means that we hold relations with human beings in multiple mediums and spaces. We have relationships in our personal lives, both in person, over telephone, over social networking, over texting, over email. And in our professional lives with our patients now, we interact with our patients not only in person, but we are now interacting with them, of course, over video conferencing, um, patient portals, texting, email, phones. And so uh, th these hybrid relationships uh, can be new to some practitioners about how, how to manage them. And within that, uh, within, the, uh, within the hybrid relationships, there's this concept of virtual space. This uh, space we interact with people that's not in per person. And um, there are certainly some different, there are, are significant differences between interacting with, with patients and others in physical versus virtual space. Um, Starting with physical space, it's really been the traditional uh, gold standard of how to interact with patients. There's an immediacy and trust in interpersonal interactions when being in the same room with someone. Um, the physical boundaries of being in the same room with someone can, can um, set sort of a, a therapeutic frame. And there is a lot of research practice guidelines, um, decades and, and literally centuries available about how to work with a patient in person. Virtual space is relatively new over the last two decades, although there is a growing body of work, evidence, and research telling us how to do it. Um, some of the advantages is that it uh, can be convenient and immediate. Um, there uh, it may create a little more sense of, of, of space for the provider and the patient. Um, that sense of space for the provider can help uh, them gain a little bit of what you would consider maybe an observing ego in the clinical situation. Um, for patients, it may give them a little bit uh, initially of a feeling of distance, emotional distance from the by, uh, provider, but it may help Patients, particularly with uh, PTSD, anxiety, other avoidant behaviors, feel more comfortable uh, and, and more control uh, on their end of the therapeutic session and allow them to engage more in, in treatment. Um, it's certainly, you can offer more flexibilities and off, uh, off hours care. Um, and especially treating patients in their homes, you uh, are rendering treatment in the environment in which a patient lives. And it gives you a little bit more information. Not only are you seeing how the patient's dressed, but you're getting to see their home environment uh, and uh, may help you with assessing the patient and developing more specified uh, treatment. Um, so uh, it may also for the patient to, uh, a decreased stigmatization because uh, they're not having to come into a specific uh, clinic. So again, may decrease that barrier to care and it may make them that virtual space may allow them to open up a little bit more. Um, there's a term called virtual disinhibition um, that, I th uh, that, that you often see with uh, technologies where people tend to be maybe a little more open than they would be uh, in, in person. Um, so those are some of both the risks and uh, the downsides and, and the upsides of virtual space. Um, some of the basic uh, do's and don'ts when video conferencing is making sure uh, that, the, that the room that the provider is working in is secure and private with doors and windows closed. Uh, and that's true for the room that the patient's in. Uh, making sure that you always introduce others in the room with you or asked to be introduced uh, 
to anyone in the room with a patient. Uh, make sure they're in line of sight. Sometimes you can be video conferencing with a patient and not see everyone in the room. So you may wanna set that uh, up front when you're meeting with patients. Um, keeping the room well lit on both ends so, they're, uh, so the patient provider can, can uh, be seen. The, uh, making sure the webcam is placed uh, appropriately above the computer screen, not below or on the side. So there's a good eye contact between the provider and patient, um, not sitting too far or too close to the camera. Um, your head should take up about two thirds of the screen. Um, and then I think uh, one of the most important things to remember is that often um, as a provider seeing someone over video conferencing, one may feel that you have less control over the, the clinical setting. Uh, I sort of feel that you give up the illusion of control. I, I, I would argue that one doesn't have any uh, more control uh, when you're seeing a patient in your office. Uh, and so providers need to make sure that they're active actively managing the room and the setting. And so that means not being too passive over the video. If, if you need a patient to close the door, uh, create more privacy or me, need to be a directive, ultimately the provider is responsible and should be proactive. In terms of adapting a personal style to video conferencing, you wanna animate yourself a little bit more than you would in person to come across the sc uh, screen. Um, you want to use picture and pi picture to watch how you're coming across on the other end in terms of your body language and perception, uh, where your gaze is. It may be uh, necessary to increase the small talk a little bit, not, uh, not um, disclosing anything or, or crossing any boundaries with conversation, but um, doing things like asking about the patient's environment and setting, not only the room they're in, but what may be going in, particularly if they're not uh, in, located in the same city as you. For example, what their current weather is, what's going on in their home environment. Um, really working to bridge that virtual gap and make that uh, connection over video. And then um, as always, as you would in person, having a very active listening stance and um, having a lower threshold to inquire how the patient's doing, you know, how they're feeling about using video conferencing. If you're feeling, uh, if it's difficult to read someone's emotion, asking them, just checking in, hey, I noticed, are you feeling a little sad? It looks like you're feeling a little sad. So a little bit more active inquiry uh, can be helpful. So um, I hope uh, I hope that uh, these uh, this uh, discussion has been helpful in terms of some basic orientation to uh, to uh, video conferencing. Uh, as I had mentioned throughout uh, uh, this discussion, uh, some resources that are very helpful are the American Psychiatric Association's Telepsychiatry Toolkit. Um, it's got a, uh, a member facing side, but also a non-member facing side with a lot of resources available. Um, the American Telemedicine Association also has a number of those resources and links. So those are good places to start um, to get uh, additional information uh, as well as the research uh, literature. Like I said, there's a large uh, literature that's instructive on how to do this well including uh, the 2018 Joint APA and ATA Guidelines document, uh, which is a brief document that summarizes over 40 or 50 different guidelines and about five or 10 guidelines from those organizations on video conferencing. That's another helpful resource. I'm Dr. Richard Ballon. I'm uh, a professor of psychiatry and anesthesiology and uh, program director in residency training uh, and uh, associate chair for education and faculty affairs at Wayne State University School of Medicine in Detroit, Michigan. Today, I'm gonna talk about an issue which is of my and should be of your concern too, 
and that's the negative impact of marijuana. We have heard a lot about what marijuana does and how wonderful marijuana or cannabis are, but somehow people uh, keep forgetting that every coin has two sides and sometimes one coin is a little bit worse than the other one. And I think especially psychiatrists have some responsibility to not only to be aware of this, but also to warn people about all these negative consequences. Because it's very important in the frame of everything what's going on in this country. So I want to say first, I'm not here to discuss the medical use of marijuana, um, you know, and cannabis. Uh, I believe that the evidence for that is slim, and I'm not going to get into big discuss discussion about it. I'm concerned that the Congress at the present time is going to introduce a bill to legalize marijuana at the federal level. You know, we had a lot of states which already legalized marijuana, at least the medical issue, uh, medical use. You know, I'm concerned in the frame of whatever is going on, the alcohol abuse during the COVID thing has been going on 30% in the country. Uh, I'm concerned that I read some articles in the newspaper that uh, parents who are stressed with their kids at home are using gummy bears as cannabidiol. Maybe that's okay, but I don't think it's okay. Um, first, I want to bring your attention to the fact that the marijuana of uh, old times is not the same what we have right now. The marijuana of old days had a fairly low concentration of THC and so on. Now we have really very potent marijuana, which may have up to 80% of THC. It's achieved either by getting plants which have more marijuana, more, more THC concentration in them and produce stronger marijuana, or it's also uh, achieved by dabbing. People can increase the concentration of THC in marijuana. So that's a, that, that's a problem. Um, so first I want to talk about some stuff which I wrote a long time ago. And um, I, I pointed out a long time ago that there's only moderate uh, evidence for some use. Uh, in some diseases and that the, the, I'm not sure whether it justifies the legalization in the US. However, there's a lot of problems with using and it's been uh, published in many, many articles in the past. It's not just that marijuana is also a gateway drug, okay? Uh, it is a gateway drug, I pointed out in a brief things uh, which I published uh, because it's increasing the chances of people getting used to opioids. All right. um, my bigger concerns than that are actually the things which uh, have been circulating in the literature lately, and that is the impact of marijuana and cannabis use on uh, cognition, on brain health and development, and on educational outcomes. Um, like I have an article here, which is published in uh, European Neuropsychopharmacology this year, which uh, talks about the fact that uh, longitudinal and twin studies report large declines in IQ among cannabis users. They're larger than their non-using peers. It's not totally clear that you can necessarily, um, you know, assign it to uh, a marijuana as an, as an etiological factor, but I don't think it, it is uh, something which we can discard and, and not talk about it. I think it's a problem which is, you know, difficult to discard because what are we going to do with our use, which is been having problems with cognition. 
you know, there are some studies which point out to the decrease of IQ. There's an article which is in, published in the Journal of Addiction, which uh, suggests that there's a decrease of several degrees of IQ um, in those people who are abusing marijuana or really using it heavily. And again, the problem is the youth. And uh, we know that uh, the addiction experts say that uh, people should really avoid using drugs heavily before the age of 25 because the brain is maturated. The brain is not done at the age of 18. The adolescence is in a bit uh, artificial uh, saying that it ends at the age of 18. It doesn't. The brain is still developing. So if you hit the developing brain with something like cannabis, you can uh, really make some permanent damages, right? There's a study on, uh, on European uh, university students, which uh, is saying that uh, the students re reported a hangover or illness, missing class, being short of money, experiencing memory loss, and the most commonly experienced negative consequences of substance use. Not living with other students and using alcohol, cannabis, sedative, and cocaine were also associated with higher odds of experiencing these negative consequences. So it has negative consequences for college students, and we know in many places uh, college is a breeding ground for drinking and smoking marijuana. So we really need to warn students that this is not the good thing to do. Um, finally, in this, area, uh, in this area of cognition, development, and everything, I would like to mention an important article which was published four years ago. It was, the leading author was Dr. Nora Volkov, which is the director of NIDA, the National Institute for Drug Abuse. And she talks about, and her co-author, she and her co-author talk about a number of issues whether cannabis use affects cognitive capacity, right? It, the, the acute, it causes the acute impairment of learning and memory and attention and working memory. We don't think about it that much. Uh, and it emphasizes what I already said, that the adolescents may be particularly vulnerable. So, you know, because uh, adolescence is a really, as I said, critical period of the development of the brain. And we have to be you know, cognizant of that. Um, you know, the, you definitely people have to be using it uh, heavily and not that just one joint uh, is gonna do it, but you know, one joint is a start and everything. The article also talked about one old issue, um, and it's the amotivational syndrome. And as Volkov points out, this has been known since 19th century. Okay, this is uh, this was emphasized in the report of the Indian Hemp Drug Commission that marijuana, heavy marijuana or cannabis use was associated with apathy which was defined as a reduced motivation for goal-directed behavior. So that is another serious problem, okay? Finally, uh, Dr. Volkov and the others talk about uh, another area where I will transition to the uh, marijuana and problems with uh, mental illness and uh, um, impairment within the area of mental illness, that's the increased risk of psychosis associated with marijuana abuse. Right. Um, they emphasize that uh, longitudinal investigations show a consistent association between adolescent cannabis use and psychosis. Cannabis use is considered a pre preventable risk factor for psychosis. So we really have responsibility toward our adolescents that we warn them and stop them from using marijuana, right? 
Um, the, uh, it also is causing probably some brain changes, which we still cannot totally uh, define because you know, imaging studies are very complicated, but there are some suggestions that they can be some uh, issues like that. You know, and Volkov rightfully says that the cumulative effect of nicotine exposure and alcohol use on morbidity and mortality has been staggering as the disproportionate criminal justice influence of the war on drugs, all right? But current efforts to normalize cannabis use are being driven largely by a combination of grassroots activism, pharmacological ingenuity, and private, profi uh, private profiteering. This is worrisome disregard for scientific evidence. This is a serious thing. I, I agree with that. I, I've seen articles which are talking about uh, increased tax revenues. Are we just preferring increased tax revenues over the health of our nation and over the health of our children? Uh, saying that it may have uh, some effect on something, uh, on some uh, illnesses where the evidence is very low, there are not randomized controls trials and everything. So I mentioned the issues of uh, what Volkov mentioned uh, and there are some other articles which actually review the literature, which talk about the fact that cannabis use doubles the risk of developing psychosis in vulnerable people. And it's a serious thing. Doubling the risk. Can we do something about it or, or what? Um, and there are many other articles which really pause that there is a link between the heavy consumption, the length of the consumption, and the early age of exposure and the psychosis vulnerability. So adolescents who will start during adolescence, who will be using heavily and long, will have problems if they're vulnerable to psychosis and it's gonna increase it. And I think we need to be cognizant of that. The other issue which um, I also would like to mention in regards to psychiatric illnesses is one which for me has been also troubling because we've seen some reports that somebody says, oh, there's a case in Texas when a veteran with PTSD got better. Usually it doesn't say in what area the veteran got better. And sometimes people say that it will, that, that it got better in the, you know, with, with his or her PTSD. Well, there's an article in the uh, Journal of Clinical Psychiatry, which was published several years ago, which has done some study, uh, they report results of a study from some database of the VA system in one area in this country. And after they covariated many, uh, uh, many problems, many issues, many covariates or whatever you wanna call it, they showed that marijuana use was significantly associated with, with worse outcomes in PTSD symptom severity and in violent behavior in measures of alcohol and drug use. That for me is a serious thing. So it means there was an increase of violent behavior on people who, who, who were using marijuana heavily. And we, again, we don't think about it. We, we associate uh, things like that with something else, with other, uh, with other uh, drugs of abuse and everything, but it's not the case. The last area which I would like to mention and discuss is the area which psychiatrists don't care that much about, but we should because we are physicians and we should pay attention to, the, uh, to that area, uh, this area too. And we should also um, bring this to the attention of our patients. And that's medical, physical health and wellness. The, you know, one thing which uh, got some attention in the literature, it's the cannabinoid hyperemesis syndrome, which means that in some chronic 
cannabis users, you can see uh, repeated and severe warm, vomiting and nausea. Okay. And it's pretty severe from what I read in the literature. Fortunately, I haven't seen a case like this. And it's interesting that those people who experience this per, uh, persistent vomiting and nausea, they also have to take some uh, frequent sh showers and baths, which sometimes help to relieve them and they, they have to cool them off. So that's just one thing and you can say, okay, well, I'll stop using this and we will see what happens. I'll get better or whatever and so on. But there are other things which again, we don't talk about this in public and you know, there are some articles suggesting it, but and the questioning whether it's true or not. Uh, but if you think about the analogy of nicotine abuse, I mean, cigarettes abuse, we are, we may face this problem too. And the problem is, what about cannabis smoking and, uh, and uh, cancer? I mean, namely lung cancer, okay? There's no reason why it should be different than nicotine. You know, it's smoking. I mean, not nicotine, I should say cigarettes. Nicotine is not a causal agent for uh, cancer, but whatever is in cigarettes is. And number one, sometimes people mix tobacco and marijuana, as I understand. But mainly there is some possibility that whatever is as is in this substance on marijuana is increasing the risk of lung cancer. Um, there's an article which I have, uh, which says that cannabis exposure doubles the risk of developing lung cancer. Again, the double risk of something. And again, um, we don't pay attention to that. There's an article which says, marijuana in the lung, hysteria or cause for concerns. Well, even the article says that it has some impact on lungs and um, that some of the impact on lungs is negative. So, you know, are we gonna wait another 50 years like we were waiting with cigarettes? You know, we all know that in the 50s, even doctors were smoking and it was a pleasant thing to show and relaxing and everything. And the problem, then suddenly we started to see articles showing that you know, people who are smoking have increased incidence of lung cancer. Are we going to wait with marijuana in the same fashion? I hope not, because it would only contribute again to the already uh, questionable uh, health of our nation. Interestingly, there's also some suggestion that cannabis use, a chronic one, can increase the risk of some testicular cancer in men. You know, there are some studies suggesting it, it's not a thing, but again, um, it is a problem, right? And you know, hopefully, uh, it, 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 hopefully it's uh, not true or it's not such severe thing as uh, in the case of lung cancer or whatever, but it is a, a thing which we need to consider and think about. Then lately we've seen some, some reports that marijuana may not be good for your heart, right? I've seen an article which is published uh, in some French journal, which suggests that in a sample of prisoners, the heavy use of cannabis uh, was associated with some negative cardiovascular outcome. Again, why would we promote something like that, which is not good for your heart? There was also a CNN Health report, which was uh, about a month ago at the beginning of August, 2020, which was uh, saying that uh, some of the studies analyzed by the medical group found that hard written abnormalities such as tachycardia and atrial fibrillation could occur within the hour after weed containing THC smoke. So that's a problem. And it says that uh, cannabis smoke containing components 
similar to the bark of smoke. I already said that's a problem also for the lungs. And it says that for anyone with existing heart disease, risk of heart problem with smoking marijuana is going up. So that's a serious problem. And the last thing I just want to mention, which also is signaling problems on the horizon, is a study which was done um, uh, several years ago and which was published in the American Journal of Psychiatry. It was looking at cannabis psychosis and mortality in Swedish men. These were male military conscripts, which were follow-ups for a long time because in Sweden they have access to the data and everything. And that study suggested that individuals with an early history of heavy use of cannabis are at a higher risk of death than those with a history of no use of cannabis. Even though this was adjusted for many uh, co confounding variables, it still was significant in suggesting that marijuana is a problem which may shorten your life if you use it heavily. Again, Many of you may argue that, okay, well, you know, if I have an occasional joint or whatever, that's not a big, not a big deal and everything. But usually people, um, you know, slide down to more use. Usually people feel that it's okay, I can use marijuana and, you know, I can try something else. I also forgot another public issue, which is going to, be a problem in the future, especially in people who smoke heavily and it's a driving impairment. You know, you can have people who are impaired heavily on marijuana. If you have impaired concentration, you know, attention and all these cognitive factors, how are you gonna drive? And we still don't have actually in many places definition, how are we gonna de define the impairment to marijuana in drivers and everything. But actually, in some, you can see that marijuana is not an innocuous thing. It is a serious problem. It's adding, as I mentioned, what, for instance, Dr. Volkov, the director of NIDA said, we are adding a problem to the alcohol abuse and tobacco use called marijuana. It's not only that people get addicted to marijuana, they have a cannabis use disorder. It is a gateway drug to other drugs, especially to opioids. It has negative outcome in, peop in young people who smoke heavily. They can be psycho psychotic. They have a lot of cognitive impairment. They can have a de decrease of IQ. Uh, they can have a motivational syndrome. They probably are not gonna function well at school and say, it is not good for mental health because we know that in vulnerable subjects, marijuana can be a problem as far as causing um, a switch to psychosis in vulnerable subjects who smoke heavily. Um, it doesn't do any well to PTSD if smoked heavily. This was a large study in the Veterans Administration population. And it also has a negative impact on patients' physical um, abusers or, or marijuana physical health. You know, that it's an unclear risk of cancer, but I think the risk is going to be there because why not in those who smoke it? Because it's similar to cigarettes. Um, negative impact on heart, and the overall morbidity is also increased. So please. Warn your patients about marijuana use. It is a serious problem. Unfortunately, the legislatures in all over this country are trying to legalize this drug. Many, many, many have been successful. Uh, and now the Congress is in getting into the business, which I think it's a wrong idea. So thank you very much for your attention. Take care.